Okay, um, today we're looking at a, an interesting, uh, a, slightly, a slightly unusual um, version of archaeology, namely the archaeology of the future by having a, an ancient perspective. Uh, the, the project we're looking at is the Evolutionary Determinants of Health project, which has had um, many helpers, as it were. And those are some of the ones at UCL, University College. Um, London, uh, with funding from the Grand Challenges Fund and the Transport Institute. And uh, these are some of the outsiders who have also helped with the project, uh, um, including architects and the Arsenal in the Community Programme. So thanks to all them. Uh, they are not responsible for what happens next, but uh, I appreciate their comments in the past. Uh, we, we all know that archaeology is supposedly the study of the material remains of the past, what happened yesterday, as it were, uh, but I'm sure we all believe that it can be used to contribute to a better understanding of the present day. It shouldn't just be an ivory tower. But uh, what we're trying to show you today, that I believe also has um, the ability to improve our future. Uh, the further back we go, the more interesting the future can be. So that's the, the premise. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell this, this audience that uh, we and the chimpanzees have, a, have a, a long relationship, going back six million years or so, uh, when the two strands diverged from a common ancestor. Uh, so we are part of the animal world, we're all primates. And the, the complex procedure whereby we diverge, or we all have a common ancestor in Proconsul, and the way in which we developed our own particular um, attributes uh, is a very complex picture, as you can see there. And there are many gaps in it, and I'm sure in future years some of those gaps may be filled, and uh, some of the supposed links may be uh, disunited. So it's a complex story, our six million year change from um, before we broke with the chimpanzees, and the very names of the many different parts of this dysfunctional family of uh, human and human-like creatures. However, well, one thing that they have in common is being good primates, they lived off the land, <coughs> they didn't live in towns, didn't have computers, and uh, survived in effect as hunter-gatherers or gatherer-hunters uh, in various small-scale societies, be they chimps or humans, uh, living off the land in wild, wide open spaces. Um, they hunted, ate meat, there were no vegetarians around in those days, and um, gathered whatever was in season. Now, all this changed quite dramatically about five, ten thousand years ago uh, when we decided to become civilized. It started off with the domestication or subjugation of plants and animals in the Neolithic as we domesticated the landscape with managed woodlands and field systems imposed on the natural world. And then after inventing urbanization, we thought we'd domesticate humans as well, or at least those of the lesser sort. So um, uh, and in that way, we became civilized. So all this happened about five to 10,000 years ago with the things that we now call the agricultural revolution, the process of urbanization, and later the industrial revolution, all of which processes moved us further and further away from the good old ancestral regimes of um, antiquity. Alas, our bodies haven't forgotten that, even if our cultures have. So we've seen major cultural evolution, but our genetic evolution has been far slower. We haven't quite caught up with urbanization from a genetic point of view. We're awfully good at computers, but we're not very good at keeping well. And you can see this through any study of uh, skeletal remains and the pathology encapsulated therein. Um, the detail of this comes from 
uh, Charlotte Roberts and Margaret Cox's Health and Disease in Britain from prehistory to present day. And basically, it's just to show you that uh, each phase of our cultural evolution, as it were, from ne Neolithic through to the Roman period and urbanization, brought with it a series of diseases for the first time uh, into the human orbit, as it were. We'll see for the Roman period, for example, we have the first evidence for scurvy, rickets, leprosy, tuberculosis, uh, and so on and so forth. You also notice that um, way back in the Neolithic, we get the first evidence for the for dish, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostasis, which is uh, always, I, um, I can just use as a proxy for obesity. Uh, and none of these things were visible in the previous uh, culture. So the more urbanized we get, the more civilized we get, the more diseases we seem to accrue. And um, these are the diseases we have uh, based on the World Heritage, uh, the World Health, Health Organization's website. Uh, a number of the, these are the top 10 killers in uh, modern urbanized society from uh, heart disease, stroke, um, to various cancers and type 2 de diabetes, etc. Now, the amazing thing about that awful top 10 is that all, and I repeat this, all are rare or non existent in non urbanized societies. That's not me saying that, that comes from uh, Stefan Lindbergh's Food and Western Disease. Now, Stephen Lind the late great Stefan Lindbergh has spent many years working in Ottawa, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, looking at the unurbanized native population there from um, a general practitioner's point of view. Uh, and he made this great study and found that they did indeed not suffer from any of the top 10 killers in Western urbanized society. They suffered from other things, uh, not the ones that are killing us today. And this table shows you the sort of health profiles of, on the far side, the Catawba non-urbanized society, the uncivilized natives, and then the three other columns, all taken from the WHO data uh, in about 2010, the same time uh, Stefan Lindbergh was working in Papua New Guinea. And if you look at the, those three columns, the brown, the yellow, and the red, they represent uh, a culture or cultures Urban, this is the global, urbanizing, becoming urbanized, and highly urbanized. In other words, that's the process of urbanization. And each stage in urbanization has a different health profile, mm -hmm. as you can see there. Now, the unurbanized Kitaba people die of heart accidents, homicide, neonatal infections, malaria infections, and uh, all a lot of problems uh, due to. Uh, childbirth, etc. And you'll notice that in the highly urbanized society, we've got rid of all those. They are not in the top 10 um, categories of things that are likely to get rid of you. But each of those columns has a different health profile. And what is interesting is in the red column, the 10 most common causes of death, having got rid of the um, problems of childbirth, each one of those 10 is not apparent in Catawba. So we have this very skewed um, concept. Highly urbanized societies can get rid of some of the diseases, but they've been incredibly replaced by a set of conditions which are not present in the unurbanized society, which does beg the question, why should this be the case? And can we use our knowledge of non-urbanized societies find out what their magic is and put that into high, high income, highly urbanized societies to make us all live thousands of years longer. So, in other words, we don't seem to be as well adapted to urbanization as we might be. So, how can we better adapt to urbanization? We just need more pharmaceutical solutions, more medicines. Uh, do we need to design better cities? Is that an architectural solution? Or should we be looking at cultural and behavioural change that better fits our biology? Uh, there are various ways of 
look at its problem, there's people looking at its problem, and one is through the social determinants of health, looking at cultural and behavioural change, and one is what we're trying to do through the evolutionary determinants of health. They're not either or, uh, they can work together, but they're two rather different approaches. I'm sure you're familiar with the social determinants of health. Uh, this is um, the work by Professor Sir Michael Marmot, um, who is who sort of invented the concept. Here we have two London boroughs. The same town, in the same year, same population, same weather. In Richmond, life expectancy is dramatically higher than in Tower Hamlets. One is in the extreme west of London, one is in the extreme east. So why should that be? Is it just because in the Richmond unemployment is only 4%, whereas in Tower Hamlets it's 13%. Uh, look at those figures, they're actually quite shocking that in the same town, in the same year, uh, we're having uh, the, the life expectancy of men and women so different in two different London boroughs. Uh, is that acceptable in the 21st century? What are we doing wrong? What can, what can we get right? So that is an argument for the social determinants of health that they're living in the entire hamlet, you're living in a borough which is deprived, it has great unemployment, uh, overcrowding, and very little green space. But are there other factors involved? Way back in 1953, there was a, what's called the London Bus Study, which was nothing whatsoever to do with London buses, but was everything to do with the people who worked on the buses. That's, that, I'm sure you all remember the good old days when a bus had two people in it, a driver and a conductor. Now the driver and the conductor all came from the same, uh, same social, had the same social economic status, often from the same street, had the same diets, the same weather, and the same working hours, and yet their health profiles were very different. Uh, one of them was very prone to heart attacks, etc., and if they had a stroke, they were more likely to die. The other one uh, had far fewer heart attacks, and if they did have a stroke, we're more likely to recover. There's quite a large study with, uh, I can't remember the exact number of drivers and conductors, but can you work out which was which? The driver is the most unfortunate person. He sits in his cab all day, isolated, sedentary, with no social contact, with all the stress of watching for little kids playing football in the street. The conductor, on the other hand, is active, running up and down stairs all day, whistling and interacting with the public. Two very different activity regimes which are directly reflected in the health profile of those two, uh, two, um, two jobs. So it's not just your social class, but your activity regime, which is, can be quite crucial. And um, so we need to find out what it is about those activity regimes that have this dramatic effect on our health profiles, which is where the English Determinants of Health um, comes in. Uh, but even uh, so Professor Sir Michael Moore, who wrote the book on the social determinants of health, even he recognises that uh, our, our, in spite of all this cultural change, our underlying biology is, is essentially the same as it was in ancient Padua. But well, we were taken to task on that and not say ancient Padua, but go back another three million years. And that, we think, is the problem. For three million years, we've been more like the conductor than we have been like the driver. Now, um, what we, what the evolution of terms of health have sort of identified is, if you like, what we call in shorthand the palliative genome. That bundle of um, genetic attributes which we are born with and cannot change. We are there whether we like it or not. And these include parts of our physiology, parts of our psychology, our metabolism, and a whole bunch of social issues, as well as our biophilia, if you like, our, our need to engage with nature. As you will see here, there's a bit of engaging with nature going on, but don't try that at home. Now, the biological <coughs> legacy of this three, four, three million years, six million years, whatever it is, uh, of various things, including our bipedal physiology, uh, we stand up, or at least I do, you don't have to, uh, our dentition, our lungs, how we breathe, our uh, engagement with nature, our immune system, 
and various social interactions, as well as how we communicate. All those are bundled into what we call the Paleolithic genome. Let's take some examples. Our dentition. We have the dentition of an omnivore up the top, not a herbivore or a carnivore. So that tells you what we're supposed to be eating. That's, that gives you a clue to what our diet should be. It's the same with our digestive system, which is different from a carnivore or a herbivore. Uh, our digestive tracts are different. They can cope with fresh fruit, vegetables, fish and meat. They cannot cope with sugar and processed foods. They're just not, uh, they're not designed for it. They're not best adapted for it yet. We haven't got there yet. Uh, and our physiology is, as everybody knows, uh, designed to walk, or rather best adapted for walking and not for sitting around staring at computers, um, which leads to various uh, terrible conditions. And our lungs are designed, or rather best adapted for fresh air. We still can't get used to these particulates. We can't cope with it. Our body won't let us. We're still way back. Uh, we're still, so we have a million year old body trying to cope with modern technology. And even, even our, our um, engagement with nature is still there and is uh, very evident in um, literally Poppins' 2008 article in The Lancet, where, he, where they looked at a large um, sample of people of you know, three different socioeconomic states, three different classes, uh, rich, medium, rich, and poor, as it were, and they looked at their uh, chances of dying uh, what, uh, in relation to how closely they lived to green space, what their access to green space was. And you had the least access to good green space, uh, all three groups uh, dropped dead more quickly and the people who live closer to green space on this side. And especially you'll notice that the, the poorer people run to large purple line, as far less of them die when you're next to green space. So it has a living next to green space is especially beneficial for the working class, it says here. And that's statistically proved. So green space is good for you, which raises the question why? Is it just psychological uplift? It is all very well, but can be temporary. Well, it probably isn't. It's probably far more your immune system. And this is the work of Professor Graham Rook and his colleagues who've looked at the immune system as a microbiologist. And uh, he's demonstrated that our immune system uh, doesn't work on its own. That, that it's, that's the way it goes. It needs to be kick-started or rebooted by in direct physical engagement with nature. In other words, the more you, the more you get muddy, or the more you indulge in um, plants and animals, and the more microbiota you collect off your mother's skin, etc., the more your immune system gets used to these things, and the more it is able to identify good from the bad don't have all that um, education of your immune system, you'll be allergic to everything you don't. So uh, it's a, a, a pioneering piece of work which means that we need pets, animals, mud and all sorts of things. And then in terms of diet, what, what is the, the ideal diet? Yeah, everybody's looking for the celebrity fad diet that will keep you going for years. But if you look at the uh, ancestral diets from uh, tribal, from ancestral communities that have survived into the modern era, you'll see there's no such thing as, well, there are, it's not just hunter gatherers, which is the term we use for these people, but some of them are fisher hunters. They have far more fish than they hunt. Or they fish, hunt, and gather. This is a, these are these names represent the proportions of food. I, if you have as much fish as you gather as you hunt, you're a fisher hunter gatherer. And if you if you have more plants and meat as the hatter, then you're a gatherer hunter. So very different diets uh, for different types of people. But you'll notice 
latest uh, holdings, and this is from uh, over 120 studies that uh, Robert Kelly did in his life as hunter gatherers. Uh, not one of them is a vegetarian. There are no, there's no such thing as a gatherer gatherer. <laughs> they all gather, hunt, or fish, or fish hunt and gather. But the proportions can change, and they still survive. So, if you're looking for the ideal quotes ancestral diet, you can take your pick, whatever, whatever you fancy, provided it contains no sugar or whatever. So all, all those will do you good, especially if you're an Inuit or whatever. So what we what we're looking at is a series of health behaviours based on a sort of proxy ancestral culture. Um, in other words, we're looking for a personal health behaviour that mimics evolutionary concordant lifestyles as best we can in the 21st century. We're not suggesting you all go off and live in a TP in New Wales. Uh, you can if you like it. But, uh, we suggest you can live in a modern urban environment, but uh, you must uh, be active and seek the right stuff and all that. Uh, you have your personal responsibility for what you do, but there are also institutional responsibilities, uh, which uh, in the way in which offices are laid out, buildings are built, uh, management approaches to um, its employees, etc. And there are also urban design guidelines to make the town, again, uh, reconfigured from an evolutionary perspective. I'll have a look at some of those in a second. So three different versions, uh, at least three different versions of how we can bring this together uh, to save the world. Now, there's the personal thing of you, you choose what you'd like to eat, but choose them from the delicatessen, the greengrocer, uh, rather than the pre-packaged shelves. And then there's the activity regimes. There's been a lot of work on activity regimes. Uh, from North America, for example, uh, 2010, an amazing paper which brought together a study of three different communities living in the same part of North America. Um, the old order Amish, the, the Mennonite, the contemporary children, are children from three different communities which represent in actual fact a 19th century culture before phones, cars and all the rest of it, a pre-war culture before mobile phones and all the rest of it, and um, modern day children with mobile phones, computers, cars and all the rest of it. So three very different cultures still surviving today, and they have the, the, um, the strength and robustness of the children in those three different communities. And they came to the conclusion that the children who are active as part of their daily life, as opposed to doing a school session after school, lifestyle embedded activity is what keeps you healthiest. So we have this concept of Lifestyle medicine, in other words, you don't just go, you don't have a you know, drink lots and then go to the gym. Uh, what you do is you have a, a healthy and active life, not just passing out. In other words, if you walk to school or walk past the way to work, it's lifestyle and value activity. It's not an add on, it's actually part of your daily life, part of your culture. Um, but to do that, you need a decent streetscape. Because nobody wants to walk to work on a street that's full of choking traffic and no trees and lots of noise. And we much prefer a streetscape that is evolutionary concordant in its design, which has a few trees. And as you can see on that top um, image there, you've got the pedestrians on the pavement, the cycle track next to them, and then the cars, and then another cycle track, and then the pedestrians. So you're trying to keep things separate designated roadways for pedestrian cyclists or cars, and you have things like trees, and it becomes a, a more livable, workable environment. That is an evolutionary concordant streetscape. And once you've got that, people are more likely to walk to work. Now, we also have a problem with our streets, in that we have our, um, you can't breathe in half of them. Now, you may, I don't know if any of you remember, the dear old London smogs of 1952, between the 5th and the 9th of December, which ultimately led to the Clean Air Act of 1956. Um, some of you may realise the Clean Air Act was a private member's bill, but not actually a government manifesto committee. I'll just mention that in passing. 
But uh, that was a response to the deaths of 12,000 Londoners due to coal-fired heating. 12,000 Londoners. You may like to know that 467,000 Europeans across Europe die of um, vehicle emission detritus. Um, so, are we getting rid of cars? No, we're going about it very, very slowly, putting better filters in, and that'll do it. We're getting rid of old cars slowly. Yeah. And we're having this extra low emissions. Uh, Low, uh, ultra low emission zone where we charge people to drive in with their smelly cars and we use that money to help with the car scrappage scheme. So we're not scrapping the car, we're not getting rid of the cars, we're doing it very slowly. About 467,000 people dying across Europe. I think someone will do something about it, wouldn't they? Shocking, really. So we need to clean the air of the streets, otherwise, people aren't going to walk about in there. Now, Okay, this is not my figures, this is Transport for London, Lucy Saunders' figures. Uh, she claims that if town plans would actually endeavor, would encourage human locomotion, walking, cycling, skateboarding, whatever, uh, with green streets, with fresh air, uh, in London alone we could save all these cases of various conditions which all relate to not being active enough, not using our genome to get out the bow and walk around. And that's that's not pharmaceuticals, that's just walking to work. <coughs> Which I think is an amazing statistic or set of statistics. It's the same with um, your office buildings or whatever. Um, you know, take the stairs, not the lift. So this is a kind of design thing. If you design, if the architect designs interesting staircases, you're far more likely to walk up and down them. And if the staircase is simply the fire exit behind closed doors, and the first thing you see when you walk on the floor for the foyer is the lift, you're not going to be encouraged to walk up down stairs. So good design of foyers with uh, spectacular Fenister and Ginger Rogers staircases are the name of the game. Then you can always have standing desks to get rid of this endless sedentary approach to life. <coughs> and you could have standing meetings. These were developed in California, where else? And you can see how happy it makes people having a standing <laughs> meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all made at home. You can even have standing lectures. <laughs> Two excellent lectures being presented. Guess what I'm going to say next? <laughs> no, you don't have to stand up if you don't want to. to uh, just me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's be less sedentary, basically. So, in other words, cultural change, thinking about how our body, in all its attributes, wants to be, and how we're refusing to let it be, because modern urbanisation. Uh, here we have a, a paper published in 2016 by the Harvard Medical School. Um, it was a um, a study of 136,000 Americans, which if they extended that to the entire US population, they could slash all sorts of terrible things by 12 to 80% <coughs> without pharmaceuticals, just by getting people to do the Paleolithic, uh, the Paleolithic correct lifestyle. And um, here we see another a study starting from the University of Newcastle, again, no pharmaceuticals, um, and this looks at uh, type 2 diabetes. It's always claimed to be untreatable, or, you know, treatment of the problem. And uh, here they come up with a concept of your personal threshold, uh, which is different in everybody, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. But once you know what your um, personal threshold is, it seems that your body uh, triggers diabetes if you go over your sort of fighting weight. So if you return your body to normal, what your Paleolithic fighting weight should be, you can actually reverse diabetes, or at least 70% of people, uh, people could do that. And they, once you've lost it, if you, a normal diet and exercise regime 
can maintain it. I did make this up. This is it's in Diabetes Care 2016, if you wish to read it. In other words, your body is telling you what you can and can't do. You just have to listen to it. So, um, based on that wonderful phrase, getting back to your normal fighting weight, uh, what we have here is a, a definition of good health. Now, the World Health Organization defined health as not just the absence of disease or ability, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being. So, you know, you have good health on the one hand and ill health on the other, two opposite conditions battling it out. But um, what the English, the English in terms of health people think is really a question of what is normal, what your body expects you to be doing, and therefore can support it, as opposed to what's abnormal, doing things that your body does not expect and can't cope with. So, what we think it is is uh, normal health or normal health behaviours and abnormal health behaviours. Um, apart from the fact, obviously, that if you get run over by a car or if you get an infectious or contagious disease, uh, which is not your fault, as it were, then you will be ill. But hopefully, your immune system will take you through it. So we're looking at normal health behaviours. Anyway. And from that, we can develop a concept of urban well-being, living in the 21st century town, uh, or urban well-being, which we were asked to define, is the state of mind and body obtained by those adop adopting evolutionary important behaviours, living a palliatively correct life in the modern circumstances, within an urban environment modified on evolutionary important lines, as green streets get through the motor car or gets rid of um, uh, Emission, diesel emissions from cars, etc., etc., as parks, things like that. Now, in order to get to that um, ideal utopia, uh, do we need a state intervention, or can we just do it by using our uh, personal behaviours, as it were? <coughs> now, the, I'm sure you're all familiar with state interventions. Uh, way back in the 1940s, we had something called rationing to ensure a fair share of food for a whole population under the stress of war. Um, food was rationed for meat, sugar, milk, and cheese was quickly rationed, uh, sugar especially, and petrol was rationed so they could walk. In other words, uh, it has been described that diet to be described as a virtual peasant diet. That was the disparaging comment, but in actual fact it's a revolutionary really concordant diet. And everyone was forced to eat fresh food growing on their allotments, etc., etc., and walked to and from there, or worked on the allotments to dig it. In other words, there was an extraordinary pace from um, 14 years of people being obliged by a state intervention to lead um, broadly evolutionary recorded life, give or take a lot of that. As a result of that, um, the health of the nation is actually better, the health of the whole nation, especially in 1950 than it was in 1930. And the statistics demonstrate infant mortality decline, adults lived longer, dental caries fell, the incidence of obesity fell, and uh, kids were healthier. And there's data to demonstrate that. <coughs> so that was a, a major health uh, state intervention, which would be, a, be allowed to do anything like that today. Could we order people to be healthy? Well, we can actually. And, um, and we need to. Um, there is a global obesity epidemic. Obesity is a disease, but it's the precursor to many things, uh, many terrible things, including diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, and all sorts. Now, it has been, again, these are not my figures, uh, these are the figures from the UK Health Forum. By 2035, not so long, 72% of the UK adult population continue on our current trend, will be obese or overweight. I think that's a somewhat worrying statistic, and uh, they will bring with them uh, these extra cases of diabetes, <coughs> heart disease, cancer, etc. It's a phenomenal cost, and yet an additional cost to the NHS of 2.5 billion. It's unacceptable. Or should we actually try and do something about it? 
So the only way you can do anything about that and get it right is to um, try to start off with child obesity. Um, did you know that 10% of children starting primary school are overweight or obese today? And did you know that 20% of children leaving primary school are overweight and obese today? Just, just make that, take that trajectory forward and you have big problems. Um, so, however, the good news is, of course, that all those children are already subject to a state intervention called the National Curriculum. We can actually modify the national curriculum to give the kids better food and also, of course, more activities. We, we can, whether we will or not, it's a, another matter, but every child has to work uh, and the teachers have to work within the national curriculum. So the only way we can hit every single child in the country is through the national curriculum. So it can be done, and uh, we're getting a 30,000 word report on this, this is just a summary of it. Um, so key stage one, five to then, we will have to increase the daily physical activity to five to uh, at least two hours a day. At the moment it's about three hours a week, which is well below the World Health Organization suggestions. Remote walk to school, preschool, school There are some schools for self busy things. And um, do more gardening, get the schools more green, and uh, measure the body mass index each term. And this is just a part of the program that's been suggested. But it can be done. Uh, each one of these things is already in the government guidelines, but the government always has aspirations rather than implementations. So I'm just trying to move that forward a little bit. Now, if we were to do that, we have to go back to this diagram here, using our knowledge of our palliative genome. And the first column over here, we have Kitawa, the unorganized people with their particular health profile, and then we have our uh, urbanizing towns, urbanized settlements, highly urbanized settlements, and up here we have the evolutionary recorded city. If we were to design the city in such a way that people would like to walk them about, uh, if we had more parks, more green space, uh, then not only could the evolutionary recorded city with its high technology get rid of neonatal infections, tuberculosis, etc., etc., but it could also take the lessons from antiquity, from our palliative genome, and insert them into the culture of a modern-day city and get rid of the top ten current um, conditions affecting globally world urbanised population. It's as simple as that, ladies and gentlemen. So um, th there we have. But there we are, but we believe it is possible to mimic, simulate evolution called lifestyles and indeed uh, redesign towns to make them more evolutionary recorded, more acceptable to our palliative genome, etc. etc. And then a lot of people do little bits of this. We have our concept of biophilic cities, which are particularly green cities, and also we already have the culture, uh, concept of ultra low emission zones. Um, we need more green space, better public transport to encourage human locomotion, etc. All these things are possible, and half of them will be there. If we bring them all together, um, we could actually make living in towns acceptable not just in terms of the culture and the uh, opportunities, but also in terms of our basic palliative health. So that's a, a view of our uncivilized, unsophisticated raw and robust palliative genome and if we understood it better as and this is the role that archaeologists have they have to persuade people this is what we should be um, if we better understand our deep archaeological past we can save the world honest gov thank you very much